Okay. All right, this, uh, this session we're going to talk about five facets of the prophetic. And uh, the, the problem that we have with this is that um, our Western mind wants to pigeonhole everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right, so our Western mind wants to say, oh, I'm this and I'm not this. And... But the Eastern mind is completely different. The Eastern mind is um, uh, pictorial rather than linear. True. And it's holistic rather than you know categorizing. In yep. other words, God's about package. Yep. And that confuses us Western people because we don't want to know about the whole package. We just want to know about this bit, you know. And we want to segregate things so that we can go, oh, that's there, and this is here, and this is here. And the Bible actually doesn't work like that. Right? The um, everything I was saying to someone earlier that everything's overlapping yep. in, in the kingdom and in the Word of God. Yep. That's why you know, I talked about the fact that encouragement can be something that just flows out of love for one another, yep. but it's also something that has a different impact when it's inspired prophetically. You know? And sometimes you can't separate the two. But we want to, our mind wants to, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And we've got to kind of try and resist some of that and say, well, God, just you know, show me things from your perspective, not from my Western logical perspective. Yes, yes. And that's a tough call sometimes. So we're going to talk about five facets of the prophetic. But I love what it says in, um, in Corinthians, where Paul's talking about the manifestations of the Spirit, and he says that the, the Holy Spirit distributes to each one individually as he wills. And again, this is the thing that, yes, yeah, so, sometimes, some people might punish it more in one area than another, but the Holy Spirit is all about a package, and he's got more than, you know, more than we know, and, uh, and he wants us to be open so he can release what he wants to release through us to whom when it's needed. So, you know, um, in fact, I think someone was talking to me last night about how that um, used to flow a lot in, in you know, discernment, but more so these days in word of wisdom. Well, that's the Holy Spirit distributing individually as he wills. There's seasons in our life, there's seasons in God, but also there's different situations. And um, so as we talk about these five facets, I guess I just wanted to mention this to say, well, let's try and resist the urge to, to label ourselves too much yeah. and to segregate these and pull them apart, but rather to see them as a part of a whole and to say, well, Lord, uh, do you want to use me in all of these or some of these or I'm open? Yes. Yeah? Amen? Oh, yeah. Alright. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And um, we're going to start from um, verse 4, I think. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Yes. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diverses, diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. Yes. Okay, so he's talking about diversity of gifts. All right, which actually means various kinds, but also has the concept of an allotment. In other words, a, an amount of this that God puts in your life. Mm -hmm. All right? Then he talks about there are differences of ministries. So he's saying, well, this person has a different ministry in this area, and this person has a different ministry in this area. And then he talks about diversities of activities. So there's all kinds of functions. Then he says, but. So this is con contrast now. And it's important that we understand that this is contrasting. He said there's, there's um, some things that God, um, that are gifts that God actually puts an allotment, an amount of in your life. In other words, yeah, I have this gift, and this is the, the limit of it that I function in. Right? It's an allotment. But then there's different ministries. In other words, different ways to serve. Because the word ministries is serve. All right? So there's different serv uh, services, if you will. And then verse 6, there are <clears throat> diversities of activities. In other words, there's some practical abilities we have that we have an allotment of, we have an amount of in our lives. You know? So for instance, um, uh, you know, I'm a musician. Now, I could be a better musician if, if over the years I worked hard on it. But the fact is that also I am not naturally as talented as my sons are. You know, they just, um, they've just got a bigger allotment in some of this than I have. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And, um, and, and we need to understand that because it's part of our makeup and who we are. So he's saying here, okay, there's, a, there's gifts that God's put in our lives that are an amount, 
like a certain capacity of it. There are um, practical functions or abilities that God's given us an amount of, you know. And there's different areas of service we can get involved in. But in amongst all this, it's all about Him. The same law, the one law. And then He says in verse 7, but. Now He switches from what God's put in us that's resonant into talking about the flow of the Spirit in our lives. Alright? But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now the key word here is manifestation. You see, you know what kind of person I am by what manifests from me. True? So you know the kind of sense of, sense of humour I have from what's happened in the last few sessions. You also know the kind of passion that's in my heart from how I've delivered the last few sessions. Yeah? Yeah. You see, it's what manifests yes. that helps us to know. Alright? So that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the manifestation of the Spirit. Yeah. In other words, the Holy Spirit who is in us and how he evidences himself. Yes. Amen. So he's not talking about resident gifts that we have an allotment of. Alright? He said there are all those things, but now I want to talk to you about how the Holy Spirit manifests himself through you so that people will see him. Amen. So there's a, a contrast that's happened here straight away, right? Verse 7. And it's about the manifestation of the nature of God. So when we go on and read about these things, these these they may be some of these things may be something that God puts resident in our lives. Yes. But there is also another way that flows, and it's a manifestation of Him in us. And then people will come to know who He is by what how He manifests from our lives. Just like you come to know me by what manifests out of my life. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Alright, so, then He goes on and talks about these manifestations. To, each, uh, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But, one and the same Spirit. So he's going back to what he said before. It's the same Lord. The same God. Right? So, here we go. Again, one and the same Spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. Why? Because it's not... Our allotment, it's Him manifesting through us. Amen. Okay? Now, as I said, some of these things can be an allotment. There are people who have been called to a healing ministry. Yes. But there are people who are not called to it, but gifts of healings will manifest. Amen. True, true. No? true. And this, if we try to pigeonhole everything, our brain will go nuts. That's it. <laughs> right? Because our Western mind just kind of goes, hang on, I've got to put everything in this nice little slot. Yeah. And God says, put your brain on hold <laughs> and let your spirit receive something here, you know? <laughs> because the Apostle Paul was talking to people who received it differently from how we did. Right? And they were able to just kind of go, well, yeah, I might have a lot, but of it, or the Holy Spirit might flow, manifest through me. It doesn't matter as long as the work gets done. That's it. Yeah? Whereas we want to go, well, is it an allotment or is it just a manifestation? <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on, isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be Eastern-minded to actually capture what the Word of God's really saying, what the Spirit is saying. All right. So we, uh, we, we're going to be looking at five facets of the, the, the prophetic. So the first one is insight. Insight. And... Um, this, this is obviously important in the prophetic because the word, one of the key words for prophet in the Old Testament is seer, a person who can see. All right? And so it makes sense then that, that uh, in the prophetic, we've got to have insight. If we don't have insight, we're not being prophetic. <laughs> and so here, the manifestations of the Spirit here that are in the insight area are firstly discernment. And um, I'll uh, talking to someone about this last night, there are different areas of discernment. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, it says here that, um, gee, where am I? <laughs> if I can find discernment, they'll be right. Uh, it says in verse 10, to another discerning of spirits. All right, discerning of spirits. And this has been, uh, in the past, um, spoken of more to do with demonic stuff. Exactly. Wrong. 
But that's only one part of the spiritual dimension. That's right. You know, because we've lost our kingdom context in our understanding, and therefore also lost our understanding of our genetic makeup, our kingdom DNA, yeah. Yeah. then we have focused a lot on the devil because he's the big threat. Yeah. But when you get an understanding of the kingdom and of our DNA, the DNA of the Father in us, then you understand the devil's not a threat, he's a defeated foe. Yeah. <laughs> he has no place in heaven. Uh, yeah. He has no place in our lives because no. the king is here and the canon's here. He has no place in the church because the church is the ecclesia of the, of the, right. of the kingdom. You know? So if he has no place, he's not the big threat that we've got to be focused on. Yeah. Amen. We're supposed to focus on the king and his kingdom and deal with the devil as the need arises. That's it. And what's more, we've got the power and authority because all power, all authority has been given to Jesus. Oh, the devil doesn't have any, nah. but we go in Jesus' authority. Amen. And when we get a revelation of this stuff, all of a sudden, the devil becomes irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> and see, that rattles some people's brains because our perspective has been, not been a kingdom perspective. It's not been a more than, more than conqueror perspective. Yes, I mean. you know? And I trust that through this weekend that um, we'll all emerge with a revelation of, of who we are in the kingdom. Amen. And what it means to be in the kingdom, not just in the churches we've known yeah. or in the churches and institutions, but who we are in the kingdom. Because the devil has no place. It tells us that in Revelation 12 and in other places. Uh, it says of Jesus that the devil had no place in him. Of course he had no place in him. <laughs> and yeah, we've got people out there running around looking for devils under rocks and behind tropes, you know? Oh, My goodness. They're irrelevant. Yeah. We have a mission to honour the king and advance his kingdom. Yes. And the fact is we've got the authority of the king and, his, and we've got the power of the king to deal with them as the need arises, but they're irrelevant to our purpose and our mission. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, I'm not mocking them by saying that, not at all. And we do need to be aware of their devices. Right? Yeah. So we've got to be alert yeah. but not afraid, like I said yeah. earlier. Um, but the fact is that discernment actually helps us not only to see where there's demonic activity, but we should be seeing how we're positioned in regard to that demonic activity. Yeah. Yeah? All right. So but I want to say here, firstly, there's discernment of the human heart. Yes. It yes. says Jesus knew the thoughts of their heart. Yes. <laughs> he knew the thoughts. Mm -hmm. He knew what was in their hearts. That's discernment of the human spirit, and that's so important. Yeah. You know, um, you can't lead people effectively without this kind of discernment. Yeah. You know? And this is not um, always having people under scrutiny. No. This is about the fact that we're on a journey together. We, we want we need to cover each other. We do. You know. Yeah. So that if there's stuff that's you know out of order in somebody's heart, that somehow along the way we we can discern it and help them, so that we can continue the journey together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know. So important. And so discernment of the human heart, Jesus was able to deal with stuff and set people free or deal with stuff and, and, and bind the religious stuff of the Pharisees by discerning what was in people's hearts. Amen. And so the whole area of insight in the prophetic is about discerning what's in people's hearts. Amen. And that, this is not about reading body language. Yeah. No. No. Not that. 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 Not uh, there are so many natural and humanistic things out there that um, we can avail ourselves of and that maybe we've been exposed to and trained in, you know, in sales or in management or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, if, if we're going to be people of the spirit and, and genuine, you know, flow in a genuine prophetic thing, yeah. we've got to, that's some of the stuff, baggage we've got to let go of. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, we, we actually have to have Holy Ghost discernment. Amen. You know, because then it's going to glorify God. If it's not that, it's not going to glorify God. And then, right. Secondly, there's discernment of demonic activity, which I talked about. And thirdly, and most importantly, discernment of what the Holy Spirit's doing and saying. Yes. See, if it's discernment of spirits, it's plural. That's it. But that doesn't mean it's multitudes of demons. No. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? They're outnumbered two to one by the angels for a start. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> And the Holy Spirit is everywhere at once, and they can't be. That's right. Come on, we need to get some reality into our thinking. Right? The Holy Spirit is everywhere at once. The devils can't be. That's right. But also, the devils are outnumbered two to one by God's angels. 
So, you know, we, we, we need to sort of get this kingdom perspective really yeah. sorted. Yeah. The reason we are those who prevail is that we are created to be a little lower than God. Yeah. That's actually what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. the, the translators couldn't cope, couldn't cope with the idea, you know, in the Dark Ages. Right. And so they said a little right. lower than angels. It's an yeah. incorrect translation. Mm. All right? We're created in the image and likeness of God to be a little lower than God. Mm -hmm. We're joint heirs with the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? That doesn't puff us up with pride. That is, is incredibly humbling to have been given this kind of privilege. But here's the thing. The angels are God's ministering servants sent to help us. They're not greater than us. But they have God's power over the devils. <laughs> but because we are a little lower than God and we go in His authority, then the devils are nothing to us. So then... The, the fact is that even though there's principalities and powers, we need to be wise about battles we take on, you know. And this is why we need to work together because no, none of us on our own can take on some of the spiritual forces that are no, out there. Right. But together we have the power to defeat them. Amen. Absolutely. But what's more important than what's in people's hearts and what the devils are doing is what the Holy Spirit's doing. Mm -hmm. And this is the greatest area of discernment that I believe we need. Like yes, we need to be sharp yep. to pick up what the Holy Spirit's doing and saying. Because if we know what He's doing and saying, then we're going to know what He wants to deal with with regard to the devil. We're going to know what He wants to deal with with regard to people's hearts. Therefore, everything is proactive initiated by the Holy Spirit. So then we're not on the defensive thinking, oh no, I've got to be careful, you know, the devil's out there. Or we're not taken by surprise if, if, uh, if the enemy starts to do something, you know. Uh, but instead, we're positioned differently. We know who we are. We know who the Holy Spirit is in us. We, we see and know what He's doing and saying, discerning, discerning of the Holy Spirit at, at work. And so therefore, out of that filter, we have a different perspective of what we discern in people's hearts and what we discern that the devil's doing. Amen? Word of knowledge is also part of the insight dimension. Yeah. It's, um, it's a revelation of, by the Holy Spirit of things that, that God knows that we don't know. Mm. That's what word of knowledge is. Yes. It's things that God knows about people or about situations or whatever that, that we can't know that the Holy Spirit reveals into us. And it's a powerful witness to people You know, when, when we have a word of knowledge. Years ago I was planning a church in the Gabba and... Um, uh, we used to go on Friday nights out on the streets in the Gabba, which was always a very interesting experience. And uh, back in those days, it was before the Fitzgerald Commission, and so there was, there was brothels everywhere, the pubs were very full on, and, and uh, you know, the crime syndicates and all that were very active, and it was, a, it was a pretty interesting place to plant a church. I was walking down Stanley Street one Friday night, praying in the spirit, and, and there's people coming and going everywhere, and about 50 metres away, I saw this guy, and as soon as I saw him, the Holy Spirit said, He's got a broken heart from a broken relationship. So I'm just, I just keep praying and I'm targeting this guy. I've you know, got my eyes on him. I'm walking towards him. You know? And he's coming and he's just kind of zoned out. You know, it's Friday night. He's out on the street. You know? But I'm on a mission. <laughs> so when he gets close, I step over in front of him and stick my hand out. And of course, everyone's involuntary action is that they respond. <laughs> so I grab his hand and I say, my name is Phil. I'm a Christian. And God, my God is the one who heals people's broken hearts from broken relationships. And he just went. <laughs> he was from Afghanistan. And he'd escaped, because the Russians were there then. And he'd escaped into Pakistan and then into northern India. Was actually living in a, um, um, in a Buddhist monastery. So he's, a, he's a, a Muslim. He's in a Hindu country living in a Buddhist monastery. A little confused. And, uh, <laughs> but then there was a, a young lady from Australia who was on, you know, a, like a hippie, you know, spiritual pilgrimage yeah, thing, you know, yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, went to the ashram and all the stuff. And anyway, they, uh, they connected, and she came back to Australia and sponsored him to come out, and they got married, but two months later, she left him. And he's walking down the street, and that's what God says to me. You see, I, there's no way I could know anything about yeah. his life. And, and I'm sure that, that many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, have had this kind of experience. That's the word of knowledge. Yeah. And this area of the prophetic is very powerful. And again, it's not just really within the four walls of the church. Yes. This is for life. Amen? 
All right, then word of wisdom. It's the revelation of wisdom from above instead of just the wisdom of this world. Yeah. It's, and you don't even have to know you're giving a word of wisdom. No, that's it. Sometimes you say something and, and the, the response will be, or later on someone will say, man, I don't know, you know where that came from, but that was exactly the answer I needed. Yes. And you're like, I don't know, we're just having a conversation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you see, it doesn't have to be a thus saith the Lord, you know? Yeah. We have formalized what should be natural, what should just flow, what should be distributed individually as you will. All right, so these, these areas, I think, are, are the, uh, the, the insight areas of the prophetic. And uh, people who, who are more, uh, have more of a bent this way, I suppose, is the best way to put it, um, they do tend to discern things mainly in the lives of people. So then that can manifest um, at times more in, in personal prophecies, you know, personal ministry. And that's a good thing. But here's the thing. We, you know, the kingdom's about team. Yeah. And also because of some of the stuff we've already shared about, we need to be careful of our own hearts and all that. And so we, we need to be accountable for what we share we do. on a personal level, you know. And, and of course, there's been all sorts of horror stories about car park prophecies and yep. all kinds of things, you know. Um, and um, the, but the thing is this, that if, if, if our hearts are right, then, then we want to involve somebody else in the process. Yeah. Now, okay, there's times when you're just alone with somebody, yeah. you know. But I think that if, if somebody really likes to get people alone and give them a word, yeah. there's something inside me that kind of goes, danger, Will Robinson, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know, prophecy is supposed to be judged. It is. It says that in 1 Corinthians 14. It does. Speak and let the others judge. Mm -hmm. And so we, 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 we should want to have it judged. Mm -hmm. And in the team in our church, we've got a great thing in this where, where you know, if somebody's got a word for somebody, uh, they'll call some, one of the other team members over and, and say, um, look, I've got a word, you know, I, I'd like you to, you know, be with me for this. You can't beat that. No, that's you right. know? Because not only is, is there then accountability in the situation, but there's safety for the person being ministered to, yeah. there's safety for the person with the word, that's but then it. also that third person can compliment the person and add something else that's into the it. ministry. Yeah. You know? It's powerful, you know? Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and that's why it says there, uh, a bit further down, 1 Corinthians 14, 29. All right, let's go to number two out of these five facets. And it's intercession. Intercession. In Jeremiah 27 and verse 18, it says, If they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is in them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts. Alright, so he's saying, this is actually one of the things that manifests if it's the genuine article of the prophetic. Right? But if they're prophets, if the word of the Lord is with them, then let them make intercession. Um, Ezekiel 22, verses 29 to 30, The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. Do you know, intercession is not about, you know, chasing devils. Not at all. It's about standing in the gap for people. Amen. Yeah. On behalf of people before God. Amen. That's what intercession is. Amen. And uh, you don't have to see devils to be an intercessor. You've got to actually have compassion for people's need. You do. <laughs> Primarily. That's the greatest thing. When you read that, it's saying people are oppressed, they're being ripped off, they're being mistreated, they're poor, they're needy, they're being you know, oppressed again, you know. Uh, they feel like strangers. And what did God look for? Someone who would chase after the devil? No. He looked for someone who would stand in the gap for them. Who would, who would actually carry their burden because they can't carry it themselves. That's so true. Huh? So if we're prophetic and if the word of the Lord is in us, then this is what we do. That's what intercession is about. Yeah, that's right. All right? Yeah. So over the page, intercessors pick up the burden of God's heart. Yeah. All right, this is those verses, we, that last verse we saw, that's God's heart for the poor, the needy, the oppressed. All right? So intercessors become alert to see and hear what God's doing and saying regarding the gaps that need to be covered. So this is not about having a holy intercession, intercession hub. You know, no. it's not about a group of people getting in a room and yelling at the devil. No. This is about us actually being moved by a com with compassion because there's a need in someone's life. There's a there's a bondage. There's a you know there's stuff going on that, that they need to get set free. There's there's um, um, patterns that need to be broken in their lives or whatever it is. 
And yes, there may be some demonic stuff there, but you know, most of it is that the, the enemy has been allowed in, but there's foundational stuff that needs intercession for. Not just the demonic activity. And you know what? Sometimes there's no demonic activity. That's right. It's there. Do you know, with Christians, we've got to believe that the, you know, that even though people have got issues in their lives, that, that the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the, covers people's lives. You know? We have to. You know, not everybody's, you know, who's got issues in their lives has got demonic problems. You know, we ascribe too much to the enemy. There's only so many devils to go around. <laughs> Come on, let's be real. Now, I'm, I'm not putting down the, the reality of it. Because I've seen many people get set free of demonic oppression, but also of demonic you know, possession and so on, um, over the years. But you know what? There, there's just not as many devils as we like to, or uh, as we hear about sometimes. You know? So this is why we need to be truly discerning. Do you remember when I was a young preacher? I used to do um, uh, youth camps partnering with uh, evangelist Tim Hall. And he would do the night meetings, I'd do the morning meetings. And uh, they were always just amazing times, you know. But I remember one night that there was this, um, this young lady who you know, came out in, you know, to the altar call and, uh, after Tim had preached, and, and, and she starts to scream. So Tim just says to me, can you get her out of here and set her free? So I'm just, I'm a young preacher full of wisdom, and, you know. I don't want to discern it, you know. And uh, so I grabbed one of my guys, because this was a whole bunch of youth groups together, grabbed one of my leaders and I said, well, hey, come with me, and out we went, you know. And uh, every time we said, you know, come out of her, she'd scream. And every time we said, be free, she'd scream. Man, she had a lot of devils, you know. <laughs> Except she didn't have one. Yeah. It was just emotional release. And I was too green to know, you know. Yeah. Do you know, we, we, we need to actually be discerning and, and pick up God's heart. What, what's God wanting to do here, you know? And, um, and in the intercession area, that's what it's about. You know, there are some things where people simply need us to stand in the gap until they can stand on their own again. That's it. That's it. For some people, we need to stand in the gap and believe for their, for their deliverance. Yeah. And I don't just mean demonic deliverance. For their deliverance from bondage to sin. Yeah. Their deliverance from wrong thinking. You know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, from strongholds and, and so on. Yeah. To, or or to, to get healing in their area of life. For restoration. Or, or for a breakthrough in their family. Or for, for them to get a breakthrough to learn how to manage their finances differently. Or, you know, or generational stuff or whatever. But, you know, this whole area is we've got to pick up God's heart burden. And it doesn't have to be to do with the demonic. It can be, but often it's not. That's really my point, I guess. Intercessors make a wall. Yeah, they do. They make a wall between that person and the problem. Yeah. You see, when, when they built the wall around Jerusalem, what was that for? That was to create a barrier between the enemies and the people. And that's what intercessors do in prayer. And uh, this is why we need discernment, because we need to know what kind of wall to build to protect. That's right. And then intercessors stand in the gap and carry the burden on behalf of others to the Lord. So where people can't do that themselves, or where they need someone to add their, their, their firepower to it, then that's what we do is we, we pick up God's heart burden, we build a wall in prayer, if you will, around them, and we carry, help them to carry the, the, the need and the problem before the Lord so the Lord can then step in and, and, and bring deliverance or bring change or bring healing or whatever's needed. Amen? And not everybody is an intercessor. True. But if you're prophetic, at some point, you're going to get called to intercede for somebody. That's right. But then some people are more called to intercession than other facets of the prophetic. And again, I think we need to get a bit more flexible in this and let the Holy Spirit distribute individually as he wills. Amen? All right, number three is pronouncement prophets. <laughs> this area of the prophetic is primarily to do with declaration and decreeing. All right? And, um, and this is uh, usually not individual, but sometimes it can be to do with individuals. But often it's to do with God's purpose for a church, or for a community, or a city, or a region, or a nation. And um, um, in Ezekiel 14 and verse 4, it says, Son of man, look with your eyes, hear with your ears, and fix your mind on everything I'll show you. For you are brought here that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. There are some people who are called primarily to this kind of ministry. Um, they're, they're actually few and far between. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> and they actually need to be harnessed with apostles. Yeah. 
because there is a, a different authority uh, with apostolic decrees compared to prophetic decrees. Yes. And, and again, I think there needs to be that complementing one another and working together. Yes. Yes. Because when you start decreeing, you're speaking to, to uh, principalities and powers. You are. And I want to tell you something, you don't want to do that on your own. You know, we've had too many people who have fought battles that were, they were never supposed to fight and yeah, got killed, true. didn't they? You know? And it's not because we don't have authority and power, it's because we've got to, firstly, we're going to grow into stuff, but then secondly, there's some stuff we're never to do on our own. Yep, God has it. not structured the kingdom that way. That's you know? He's structured us to be team, to be a company of people working together. And, uh, and it's so important that we, you know, as I've, as I've said earlier in the, in the seminar, that we surrender our individuals.